Yes. Now I, I get it. Like, I understand now mm. that you have to have a business mindset. And I, I had to have gone and done that coaching course because I wouldn't have got it mm. if I hadn't done that. But I had to still have this desire and, and passion for the social issues that we need to address yeah. as a community, not the non-profit sector yeah. versus the profit sector, the for-profit mm-hmm. sector. Ruth Knight is a PhD researcher and lecturer at QUT's Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies, of which I am a very proud student. Now, Ruth is passionate about social enterprise, and we spent a lot of time unpacking what that is in this episode. She has dedicated her life to justice work, to empowering the underserved and the hurting in society. She has a huge heart, and she has an incredible incredible story. Guys, I would not be surprised if at the end of this podcast, you end up heading back to university to study social enterprise or nonprofit studies as a result of listening to her speak, just like I did when I decided to go back to uni. Guys, here is my interview with Ruth Knight. Dr. Ruth Knight. It is so good to have you on Yay. the show. Thank you for having me. Is it is it weird to be called a doctor still? Yeah, it is actually. <laughs> like, it really is. It's taking me a long time to get used to the idea that, wow, yeah, I'm a doctor. But as my kids say, I'm not a real doctor. No, you're well deserved <laughs> of the title. I mean, goodness me, it's, it, that's a phenomenal achievement. Did you ever think you would be a doctor? Um, Never in a blue moon. Really? I was terrible at school. In fact, I failed year 12. I I was... Anyone who knew me at school would say there's no way, you know, she would ever even go back to university, let alone come out with a doctorate. So it really is very surprising that... that I, I suppose that I built to the moment where I was, I was so intrigued with the nonprofit sector and what I could do to make a difference. And that led me to completing a PhD. And I'm telling you, it wasn't all happy days. There was a lot of tears and tantrums and a lot of stress involved in that. But yeah, I'm really, I am proud, very proud of myself, but also very honored that I now am able to not only work at a university and share what I've learned with many other people, um, that I get to talk about research and the mm. importance of good research, yeah. especially around nonprofit and community and social impact issues. Yeah. Mm. Well, I have the privilege of calling you my lecturer because you roped me into to, uh, yes. joining the ACPNS, <laughs> which is the Australian Centre for... Philanthropy and nonprofit studies. Thank yes. you. I was almost, I almost <laughs> forgot. Um, but and and you're a researcher as well. You're neck high in getting ready to launch a new course. Can you tell us yeah. about this course? Well, one of the great things that we have been doing for a number of years is having courses around social enterprise. So social enterprise. Um, as you know, is yeah. a is a new form of business, and I won't say new form, but it's it's a it's a form of business that looks at both economic and social outcomes. So it's a form of business where it's a commercially run. Mm. So it's that there's an economic viability about the business, but the purpose of the business is to create social impact. Mm. Now it has been around a while, but. I think in this day and age, it's really building momentum. Yeah. The whole sector, the whole, uh, the idea that, wow, actual fact, business can create social impact. Mm. People are very, very excited about it. So for many years, uh, we have been running that course and teaching people about social enterprise in our postgraduate courses. But the very first time in 2021, we're going to be offering that course to undergrad students. So that students from anywhere, from any university can come and do this course and they'll learn about social enterprise, how you develop a business plan that not only looks at your economic impact, Mm -hmm. but looks at your social impact as well. 
Yeah. Well, I I just remember the the one subject that you you taught me, which was social enterprise. The amount that just blew my mind when I thought, hey, there's um, so many opportunities. It's the future of uh, for 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 profit businesses as well. It's this hybrid model that kind of. Uh, I think there's just so much, um, so much to learn about. It blew my mind, and you're a phenomenal teacher. I think it's because there is such this heart of care and compassion. I remember yeah. you got me into this course. <laughs> I had my first assignment due. It was an annotated bibliography. <laughs> I never heard of it before, and I was petrified because I had, I just didn't even know how to use this referencing tool. All <laughs> yes. the references we needed oh, to do, right. and you just. You took my phone call and you said, all right, here's what we're going to do. Let's do a lot. And this was in the middle of COVID. We, we really couldn't yep. even see each other at yep. that point. And you're like, I'm going to jump on Zoom. I know a couple other students. Let's do this. And you helped me yep. get that first assignment done. And now I'm halfway through and I'm just absolutely loving it and so thankful. But you've got this compassion about you, this heart to help and to serve. Um Business, though, hasn't always been your main focus like it is now. And we'll talk a bit about yeah, the social yeah. enterprise You're stuff. You're going to make me start crying oh. already. I oh. told you. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, when you, you're you a, a nurse, is that right? Um, is that kind yes. of your background? I'd love to get yeah. a bit into the where it all began yeah. for you and your heart to really help and serve. And, and Yeah, my career has been quite a journey. Yeah. Um, as I told you at school, I wasn't I wasn't academic in any shape or form. I wasn't you know I wasn't really into studying, um, but I knew that I wanted to do something mm. of the helping profession. Didn't mm. really know what that was, but I failed year twelve, so I, I wanted to be a teacher. Funnily wow. enough, that was my my one and only goal. I wanted to be a drama teacher, but because I failed year twelve so terribly, I didn't. They didn't oh. accept me into uni. So I thought, oh, okay, well, what do I do now? <laughs> well, yes, maybe now. But at the time, it was probably not the right moment for me to sure. really go to university. So that, But it also obviously made me feel a bit of a failure, you know, like, wow. well, you know, I can't go and study what I really want to do. So I was really quite lost. I, I didn't have a plan B. I just, all my friends were going off to university or they were getting work and, and I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do or where was my next step. And what happened was that I read a magazine, like New Idea, like, you know, it was just a, you know, just an off the shelf kind of magazine. And I just read this amazing, incredible article about Mother Teresa mm. and her charity, the Missionaries of Charity. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened, but I just said, I want to go there. I want to go to Calcutta. I want to go and see this organization called wow. missionaries of charity and so i did i packed my bags i was 18 You're and kidding. this is a few years ago so there was no internet there was no you know <laughs> my poor mom i'm thinking back now going my poor mom i just literally packed my bags and said see you later Come on. um and i went off to india and i arrived in calcutta did not know anyone anything i i was yeah 18 and um, I got lost on the oh very first goodness. day that I arrived in Calcutta. It was the most scariest moment really? of my life because, yeah, it, what Calcutta happened? is a really big story. There's, well, do you want to hear it? Oh, I do. <laughs> Getting lost in India the first day you're in there. In Calcutta. That's, Calcutta yeah. is yeah. a population of millions. Yeah. And uh, beautiful Indian people. I mm. love the Indian people, but they're very different to a little white 18-year-old. <laughs> okay, here I was. I'm a sure they were quite enamoured with you. <laughs> Everybody looks at you. Uh, you you know, you walk down the streets like uh -huh. this because it's so populated. And yeah. to me, it was a, a massive city and I'd never been there before and just everything looked the same. And it's you have to watch where you walk mm. because there's not really any roads and streets, you mm -hmm. know, because they're... It's just a, it, the, the sights and the smells and the sounds of India is just overwhelming, yeah. overwhelming. It's like assault on your senses. It's, <laughs> it is an assault, yeah. And so I got lost. I didn't know and I didn't see another European or anyone I could 
like ask anyone of, uh-huh. you know, for hours and for eight hours, eight wow. hours, I wandered around the streets of Calcutta. Oh my goodness. And I was starting, when the sun was starting to go down, I started to get a little bit scared because I really didn't know where I was or how to get back to where I was staying or, and this is the story that mm. I, after eight hours, and it was probably about, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, it occurred to me that I probably should kind of pray because <laughs> that was the only thing left to do. Other, yeah. You know, I'd asked a lot of people directions, but I didn't understand what they said. My mum always told me it's the first yeah. thing you should do is pray, but yeah. quite honestly, <laughs> quite often, you know. It was the know. very last <laughs> resort. And I went, the only last thing I have to do is to pray, yeah. right? So here I am and I, I just... I just went, God, please help. You know, one of those really short, like desperate prayers. And I looked up and I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm standing outside a church. And here I was standing outside this massive, it must have been an Anglican or something. You know, Uh really, they have some very big old churches there. And I I thought, oh, this is a church. And... So it's gated, and so I was peering through the gate and hollering out, you know, hello, hello, anybody here? And this lovely little Indian gatekeeper, like they had a little gatekeeper Mm -hmm. there, and he came out, and all I could think of to say was Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa. (laughs) The only thing I can think of saying. And he said, come, come. He literally came out the gate of the church, pretty much took my hand, and I am not kidding you. We were literally about three blocks down from oh Mother Teresa's gosh. mother house, which is where I was trying to head eight hours earlier. Oh, my goodness. And he just said, here. And he he just took me right to the door. And I was at this point like, you know, the relief yeah. and the kind of wow. Like I was, yeah, partly in shock, partly right. relieved. And I knocked on the door and a beautiful little nun opened it and said, welcome, welcome, well, took me in. And I sat down inside the mother house, just again, overwhelmed with what this had just occurred. And this beautiful um, American lady came up to me. She said, hello, where are you from? And I mm. said, I just arrived and I don't know where I am. And I told her the story, oh, you no. know, and she said, I'll, I'll take you back to where you're staying. Yeah. And from then on, I stayed there six months yeah, working with the Missionaries of Charity, both in Calcutta and in Delhi. And I worked with a, a beautiful English missionary in the northern part of India as well. And I just had the most incredible six months that changed my life, changed wow. my life completely. And I credit that to where I am today and what I'm doing today because I went back yeah. convinced that I was going to become a nurse and mm. I was going to go and work back in somewhere like India um, wanted to go and do development work mm. and felt very strongly, you know, that I that, that was my calling then. Mm. So I headed back to England. This is where I lived at the time yeah. and where I grew up. So I went back to England and applied to go to nurse, nursing college, and which is what I did, and became a clinical nurse. Then I went on to do tropical medicine. So I studied extra year doing tropical medicine Um in the preparation of going somewhere to a developing country yep. and doing something. Afghanistan was actually one no of the way. countries I wanted to go to. Now, this is a long time ago. I never even heard of the place before back then. Really? But I knew that, um, well, I I knew that they were doing um, operations on the eyes, like Fred Hollows. And yes. that's, I really got very interested in the concept of maybe going out to field hospitals and doing operations in a country called Afghanistan, which I've never heard of. And um, anyway, that didn't I didn't end up doing that, but nevertheless, the training of being a nurse and learning about health and community health was really then what took me then into the community. And I started yeah. working um, in England in community health. And yeah. So year 12, failure. <laughs> yes. You know, you study nursing yeah. after this incredible inspiring career. I could just imagine those eight hours you're sitting there thinking, yeah. what am I doing here? And yeah. then finally when you are greeted by the the nurse 
or the American nurse that yes. says, you, you hear this is yeah. it. I could imagine this thought, well, this is right where I'm supposed yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah. And the, f- yeah. the flood of emotions that, yeah. go, that yeah. you would go through. Um, but here you are now, completed what? how many nursing qualifications <laughs> and your doctorate. Yeah. Um, that's remarkable. And I think it goes to show that, you know, you, it doesn't take all the 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 qualifications to start it actually takes the heart and willingness to just go get on a plane say mum i'm going to india yeah. and you never know what doors yeah. and what path may take you absolutely i want to le- dig in a bit more about your your healthcare industry and maybe how that switch from healthcare mm. to to more of an economic mm. kind of focus that you 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 bring now um what was it that you that really um, you saw um, were some of the greatest needs in in helping in the developing world with um, and and e- even with your youth work as well yeah. in England as yeah. well you can tie yeah. a lot of that yeah. into what were some of the issues that you you faced there um, I'd love to kind of get mm. your perspective on that. So what happened is that I did my nurse training. Um, I again thought, well, I'm going to be a nurse now. That's you know I. Wasn't I, I switched a little bit from going overseas, largely because I met my future husband and he wasn't as keen as me. Mm. But um, but I I focused then on England and, and working with young people in England. Now, I had actually grown up in a foster care home. My mum mm. and dad were foster carers. And so I already had a great understanding of... The issues surrounding child protection, uh, foster care, you know, those kind of issues. And so there was already in me this sense of um, social justice and Mm. working with those who were underprivileged and, you know, abused. So what happened was that when I, um, again, was thinking, well, what am I going to do now? If I'm staying in England, what does that look like for me? And I saw this job advertised, which was running a community centre for young people, who homeless young people. Wow. And I thought, well, hmm, that, that sounds really interesting and challenging. Remember, I was, only 20, I was still only 24 at this point. Wow. And I didn't think that I would get the job, but I did. Wow. With no experience of running community organisations, <laughs> I'd just trained as a clinical nurse in a hospital. So I, you know, I hadn't done really any community health up until that point. Mm -hmm. But I was given this opportunity. This opportunity um, was, yeah, given to me. And I just loved it. I just loved it because what it meant was that every day I was working with young people Mm -hmm. who were homeless. But because of that, I got to understand the deep issues and complexities that surround homeless young people. So, mm. you know, in those next four years while I was doing that, that I was got the to real see education. everything. Yeah. I wow. re- it was a deep dive into why homelessness occurs and yes. what are the systematic and sy- systemic issues about child abuse, child protection, um, homelessness, drug abuse, trafficking, domestic violence, you know, all of those things that come along with homelessness and are, and, and are, are either the reason why it happens or the consequences of homelessness. So this massive, yeah, deep dive into, well, how do we solve homelessness and what are the underlying issues that we need to think about and address before you, because it's not just about giving people a home. It is not just about here's Mm -hmm. a house, you know, here you go. Now, now we've solved it. There's, you know, so many issues that we need to address before we give homeless people a house. Yeah. I mean, homelessness is the symptom, right? And it's like you can treat the symptom but you're not dealing yeah. with the root causes yeah. what yeah. let's take homelessness for example or at least what you learned in that that, that yeah. time where you're serving as the, the yeah. leader for this community community homelessness program yeah what what did you discover were, were those mm. those root causes i mean i don't yeah. think they would change so much mm. today 
So this is where I have to be really careful. Yeah. I don't get too emotional mm. because the biggest thing I learn is that we're all hurting. Yeah. We all hurt for certain reasons and, and we all try and cope with our hurt in different ways. And a lot of people treat it with drug abuse, mm-hmm. alcohol, relationships, domestic violence. You know, all of those are ways or reasons to try and cope with our lives and, you know, the hurt that's in our lives. And young people who don't have a really stable home or a stable relationship with their parents, wow. you know, they miss out on a lot of the education and the support. That even, even kids who do have great parents and do have stable homes, even some of those young people, you know, if they have high anxiety or if there is disability or if there's, you know, all sorts of things going on, you just can't, um, you just can't say a homeless young person is this per type of person. You can't put them in person. that category. No, you can't. You can't. can't. So what I've learned, so I'll get back to your question. Yeah. So what I've learned is that we're all hurting in yeah. some shape or form. And it is it is the system that we need to address about how we prevent that hurt becoming destructive. Wow. And putting in place really early on, which is why I went on to work with young mothers yeah. because I went, I, I started to go back, back, back going, how early do we need to work with people to ensure that we put protective factors around them? And I'm not saying that we need to just get rid of the hurt, okay? You know, bad right. things happen. Yeah. You know, that's that's just life, you yeah. know, and we all have a form, you know, a little bit of anxiety and we all have things that happen in our life. So I'm not saying get rid of that but how do we get protective factors around young people in particular and families Mm. so that they are able to be resilient so they're able to you know overcome some of those challenges and hurdles in life and hopefully not end up homeless or mentally ill or uh, suicidal or what all, all those as you say consequences are because of not being able to cope with their hurt and their need for love and love and security. Yeah, I love that that emphasis, emphasis on relationship um, yeah. is a, a source quite often of just healing. When you a program won't always fix someone, but a, a compassionate person in your life that will actually care for you, walk alongside yeah. you, listen to you. Um, and understand maybe why you're reacting or responding in this way. Um, thank you. Yeah. And you know what? I still get notes and emails and texts mm. from young people that I've worked with years ago. Mm. And it is never about what I did. It's always about how I responded to them and the relationship that I had with them and the fact that I just encouraged them, affirmed them, you know, showed some empathy. And, you know, when I, and I mean that, that deeply touches me when I get any kind of feedback, even from students actually, even today, that feedback, even if it's just a little text that says, thank you, I know it's never because of what I taught them or the book that I told them to read or the mark that I gave them that's mm. nothing to do with it it's really about how encouraged they felt and how supported they felt and the, maybe a couple of words mo- words that I might have said in the right moment right time and so yeah so that's what I that's what I hope to do I hope to always just say the right thing at the mm. right time that gives somebody gut you know, the ability to say, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. Or, yeah, I'm okay. Or, yeah, you know what? Somebody is thinking of me. Yeah. It's marrying that, it's marrying justice and the need to address an issue with com- compassion, right? Like, um, I've experienced your encouragement along the way, your belief in me that you're going to make it, you're going to get that <laughs> yeah. assignment in, don't worry, but whatever it may be. Um, yeah, I think we I overcomplicate what, um, and I think that's really helpful for, for anybody listening, 
is we o- we can overcomplicate the difference that just the simplicity of yep. being kind to yep. somebody, especially who might even be acting out, might yep. might be expressing their hurt in an in an anger way, um, but when we respond with empathy and kindness, yeah, um, there was a really uh, moment in my life where. I had to challenge that myself and that was when I wanted to form my own organisation. So I'd been working in the sector but I felt that there was a massive gap. Now this is in the Gold Coast now. I've Mm. been working in homelessness in the Gold Coast and realised that there was this massive gap for teenage young mums. I was running a homelessness service but was having to turn away young mothers who were pregnant. And, you know, this is teenagers who were pregnant or parenting and I, I, I was struggling with this for, for for ages, for a long time and, yeah. and going, why is there not someone out there that's offering hope to young mums, these girls who get themselves pregnant, they're pregnant, whether, it, you know, whatever's yeah. happened, but there's no one who will take them in, no one who can offer them a safe bed for the night, nothing. And so that led me to think, oh, well, I'm just going to have to do it myself. Just and <laughs> get the spare bedroom out or yeah. make a spare bedroom? No, I wanted to set up an organisation. Oh, yeah. I wanted to set up an organisation and uh, not just me. There was a few of us that I, I encouraged um, and said, this is where the gap is in, you know, the need in our community. Yes. And if we're going to do something, I really believe it's it's really addressing homelessness right at the beginning because we don't want to perpetuate that cycle if those young mums are are homeless you know they're they're having a child while they're homeless it's just horrific so anyway um we went through the arduous task of trying to set up a charity and as you know Mm. it's not easy not not a lot of work (laughs) And I'd never actually set up a charity myself. I'd always worked for existing, you know, organisations. So I went down this journey of learning how to set up an organisation. And I remember distinctly a conversation that I had when I rang, I think it was the ATO, and rang up and said, can you give me some information? Or I can't remember what I was asking, but something along the lines of now, you know, I'm setting up this charity and I'm just checking I'm doing the right forms and everything. And I, she said to me, Mrs. Knight, we don't need any more do-gooders. Those words, those exact words, right? Wow. And I was floored. I was like, what? Did someone just actually say to me, well, number one, she was, that that wasn't a nice term. I don't think she was using it in a nice term. She was kind of accusing me of being a do-gooder. Wow. And I was setting up a charity for young mothers. Like, how how is that possible that someone would feed that neg- that like it's too hard? Don't just you yeah. just a do gooder. Don't do it. Well, that didn't stop me, did it? I'm sure <laughs> because that, I, that, that put just fuel in your far rocket in ship. my <laughs> belly. I just thought, my goodness, I'm definitely going to be a do gooder. Like yeah. I just turned that around and said, yeah. I'm going to work this out and I'm going to work out how to do this. Yeah. And uh, we did set up a charity for, and, we, you know, we did some amazing things mm. as part of that organisation. But I, I suppose telling that story is because I've since realised that it is, it is people who are do-gooders yeah. that are passionate about you know, justice and and social justice and how we can really make a difference in our community. And if you see a gap or a need, figure out how to do something about it. Don't wait till someone else is. Now, if there is someone else doing it, like join forces, collaborate, go and volunteer, go on their board, whatever you can do to support if someone's already doing it. Mm. But if there's a gap or if there's someone not doing it, we need to talk about it. We need to say, here's here's an injustice. Mm. Here is something we need to address. Mm. Mm. And it takes people to be, you know, stand up and say, well, this is going to be hard work, but let's do it. Uh, I I thank you for the passion that you bring and the inspiration you're inspiring other students to to see all the different avenues that they can do that. There isn't just one cooker cutter way of making a difference. Yeah. Like you said, you can join other people. Yeah. You could start your own. You could start a for-profit business yes. that actually <laughs> That's right. 
right. Can can address not only the immediate need, but can um, yeah. can build um, and impact others, whether it be through employment um, and and purpose. So how did how did then yeah. to kind of fast forward That's to a good that segue. <laughs> that kind of the many ways in which people can make a difference without feeling you just have to be a Mother Teresa, let's say. There are so many avenues and ways to do that. And I lo- um, Where did the sm- switch happen for yeah. you, though? Like, how did you then kind of pivot and turn to yeah. Uh, yeah. the social enterprise realm? Yes. So here I was working in the non-profit sector, very compelled by the issues that the non-profit sector addresses. But... I really was frustrated, frustrated that nothing seemed to be changing Mm. and also that I was finding it hard to make a living, that, you know, I was a consulting at this point Mm. and I was trying to work with charities but nobody has any money and I certainly never even wanted to charge them because Mm. I felt terrible about, you know, even charging people for my advice or my Mm -hmm. consultancy So I was thinking, oh, I've got to do this. I was trying to think about strategically, how could I do this a different way? And I thought, well, businesses have got money. And what I know is is as helpful to a business, you know, as a nonprofit in some Mm -hmm. respects. So I thought I'll go off and train as a business coach because if I learn how to coach Mm -hmm. businesses, I can charge them and then I can, you know, do all the things that I want to do with the nonprofit sector cheap or for free. Right, so this was my big plan. So, uh, and I was running a business myself, like, so I thought, well, I should, you know, it was all going to be helpful. So I went off and did a business course on top of the PhD that I was already doing. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) But I really felt that this was important to me. You don't know how to do things in halves, do you? It's like all or nothing. I know. But I, but again, it was the most incredible opportunity for me to see how businesses operated and their mindset and for me to learn how to run a business and go, hang on, business is all about making money Mm -hmm. and it's all about how many Mm -hmm. widgets can you sell and, you know, all this very, very focused on the money and the customer and, you know, but I I learned a heap of good stuff from that. But I couldn't pull myself away from the fact that, but hang on, how is that reducing homelessness? How is it reducing mm. unemployment? How is it how is it addressing some of the issues that are deep in my heart that I can't I can't just pull it out. I can't just sort of say, I'm gonna forget that now, mm-hmm. you know? And so so this is where this kind of like journey for me started and I started to go, well hang on, is there an opportunity for businesses to actually address social issues. And I started to learn about social enterprise and I started to look at this model and and I started to just do a whole lot of research about it. And then it wasn't until ACPNS, so the Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies actually said to me, Ruth, we actually want you to come now and be part of our teaching team wow. and teach others about this. And at that moment in time, I couldn't have been more better suited mm. to then going, yes, now I, I get it. Like I understand now mm. that you have to have a business mindset and I, I had to have gone and done that coaching course because I wouldn't have got it mm. if I hadn't have done that. But I had to still have this desire and, and passion for the social issues that we need to address yeah. as a community, not the nonprofit sector yeah. versus the profit sector, the for-profit mm-hmm. sector. So, yeah, so this is how it's happened. And, and of course, I'd, I'd done my, my master's in, in governance. And, yeah. you know, so I, I'd learned a lot already about running and managing nonprofit organisations. But this is where then I, I started to really pivot towards the, the social enterprise and mm. started to get really excited. And when you get students who are from the nonprofit sector go, why have I got to do this little unit on social enterprise? I, I'm mm-hmm. not a business person. I don't want to do that. And I go... Just wait and see. <laughs> and I see them at the end of the unit. Oh, yeah. It's the favourite. <laughs> I get that all the time. And them say, wow, this is the unit of 
all of those other yeah. you know, accounting. I was going to say when you're competing <laughs> against like board governance versus social enterprise and making yeah. a business plan for yeah. social enterprise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, you know, they come out and say, yeah. "Wow, this is possible," and it is what we really need the future to look like. Because it's hard work fundraising, and I'm not saying it's bad, it's great, but it's hard work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so to blend that idea of. I love that you know, idea of blending. I like the idea of taking the best of non profit, right, and merging it with the best of for profit. Yeah. I think of, I know so many businessmen who are just so successful businessmen. And yet I hear them say to me all the time, I've spent most of my life and career in, in non-profit um, charity work. They're envious of me and they're like, I just wish I could just, I just, yeah. I just want to give up doing business and I just want to help and serve the poor. And um, without saying, you know, quite often I've said in the past, I've said, no, you just do what you do yeah. and give some of your money to non-profit yeah. as if that's the answer. Yeah. But it's not the answer. No. What if you were to pivot yeah. and turn and transform what you do where yeah. it's not just about, hey, is our stock price rising? Is it just profitability, unfettered capitalism, whatever you want yeah. to call, yeah. which is the end goal quite often yeah. you, you know, of business? What if it, we were measuring how are we doing when it comes yeah. to our impact on the environment? Yes. How are we doing when it comes to... You know, h- how we're impacting the social good of human beings. Is this yes. healthy for them, yes. their minds, That's their, right. their, their bodies, yes. you know? Yes, who are we employing? You know, employment is such an incredibly uh, important thing for people who are homeless or mentally ill or Come have on. a disability. Yep. Now, you don't have to have your whole workforce with a disability, but even if you had a percentage of your workforce that you knew couldn't go and easily get a job in another Come situation, on. you'd be changing those lives and those families instantly by giving them a job, instantly. You'd be giving a homeless person the respect and dignity they needed to go home, to go home because now they have the money now for they rent, have a home. right? Now they have Independence a home. now. They're not de- in a state of dependency, Absolutely. paternalistic kind of... Absolutely. Give them, put them in a course so that they learn about resilience and mental health at the same time. Just give them a little bit of PD yep. alongside their job. Now that person is learning about resilience and mental health and how to turn up for work with enthusiasm. You know, like you can change a life so easily through business. Mm. But you can obviously do much better things like that. You can look at human slavery in your mm-hmm. supply chain. I was just talking to a company the other day who was yeah. trying to sell me something. Mm. And I actually said to them, so what's your human slavery uh, principles? You know, tell me, is, have you looked at your supply chain to make sure there's no trafficking or human slavery? And they, he said, oh, I've never, never thought about that before. And I said, mm-hmm. well, why not? Why you, this company must get their products or from supplies from yeah. somewhere. And most likely, there's an overseas part of it as well. Mm-hmm. This company has never been asked by a consumer, what is your stance on human slavery and your supply chain? Mm. Now, so, you know, hopefully I've made that person go back and actually ask some questions of that company. But a company can easily make a difference by actually thinking yeah. about their supply chain and thinking about social procurement, what we call social procurement, which is buying from social enterprises. Mm -hmm. Don't go and buy from a company that just only cares about profit. Go and buy from a social enterprise that actually is making a difference. There Mm -hmm. are so many wonderful social enterprises that you can buy things from. And just simply through your purchase, you are making a difference to the people they employ or their supply chain or their suppliers yeah. in some way, whether they're from overseas or even Australia, you can make a simple but huge difference yes. through your purchase. It's keeping people accountable, right, yeah. as well. It's keeping that business accountable as well as not only having an impact with your purchase, it's hopefully making big changes yeah. at the top where they actually... Yeah. Wow. Wow. As you can see, we could probably pick any topic in this and and riff off of it. Um, what have been some of the highlights of of your more recent work in um, in you know this social enterprise? Could be with 
with lecturing. It could be this new course you've got coming <laughs> up. I mean, yeah. what's some of the things that are really... Um, yeah, look, I think um, my highlights are when I actually see and hear students who take what they've learned and they run with it, for whatever it, that is. And in this case, you know, seeing people who take the idea of social enterprise and go, actually, I want to do that. And mm -hmm. they go off and actually do it. And then, you know, they give me a call or I watch them on social media and go, they're, they're doing it. They're really yes. doing it. Now, that, that just gives me the biggest buzz, right? Because you never want to just be preaching or just just talking to people and going yeah. in one ear and out the other. You want people to like go, wow, let's, what can we do with this? And then, because that's my goal now yeah. is to not work with one organisation. It's to work with all of these organisations because they're all leaders. You know, mm -hmm. there's many, many people that come to our courses, and so hopefully, I'm, 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 I'm the little stone, and I'm hoping that I'm making the ripple effect yes. and going out. So I might be making a big difference that I don't know about. Yeah. But that's my hope and my goal. So, but any kind of little feedback that I get about that, or if I see something that I think, yes, you know, there's someone who's been in my class and look at what they're doing now, or they've been to a webinar or they've been to mm -hmm. my tea and buns which is my little community yeah. practice Check that, that i have out. every month tea and buns is it tea and buns on, on it, facebook it, or um, how do they find yeah, out about I, it if you follow me on social media so linkedin or, or twitter yeah, yeah I, I always talk about tea and buns which is once a month yeah. i just basically open my office door but in the virtual sense yeah. so it's a zoom call anyone is invited and we talk about all sorts of different topics and issues, you know. And so that is another way of me just talking to people about issues that are important to them, issues that are important to the sector, research that's come out, anything. Yes. It really, it's a really a, a, a wide array of, of things that we talk about. But anyway, so my highlights are those, that all that little feedback yeah. that someone has taken and gone, it's not just gone in one ear and it's it's really made a difference to them mm -hmm. and their work. Um, well, did you know the last people that I interviewed, um, that the live podcast right yes. now as we're talking is Mantua, a I social enterprise. To it. With, uh, and I thought this would be perfect bringing you in, having this being the latest episode. Um, they were brought under the wing of, I think, uh, Tom Allen um, and the White Box Enterprise brilliant. crew. Um, and it just is so phenomenal. There's a whole kind of group of people that are trying to provide all the coaching and support yes. and the finances to help get these social enterprises off the ground, just like Mantua Sewing Studio, yep. which is yep. doing something very close to my heart, which is empowering especially those that have a, yep. a refugee or migrant background, providing them the dignity, education and training, and then a job. So the reason why we need that community of support and mentoring and education for social enterprises is because we need people to teach them business skills. Mm. They've usually got the social stuff down oh, pat. Sure. They that's you they've normally they understand what's leading them to this idea that they want to do something to help the community. Yeah. It's the business side that these people who are running social or starting social enterprises, that's the thing that they really need help with. Um, right. So, uh, yeah. And they've probably got the passion and the enthusiasm to yeah. to go with it too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. starting a business is one thing. If you don't really passionate about yeah. it, it's probably not yeah. going to get very far. Yes. Because the minute you hit the first hurdle, you're like, well, I guess let's try something else. But if you're passionate about yes. something, they've got it. They yes. just need the, the railroad, right? They yes. need the, the budgets and yes. the business plans to help keep that train on the tracks there. Yeah. Totally. So my other really exciting thing that you mentioned was the new course that we're mm. running in next year, which is an undergraduate course. So this is for business students. Actually, it can be for any students, um, but it is a business course unit. And young people who are just starting out on their undergrad degree can come and do this unit, can choose it. It's an elective, but they can choose it and learn about social enterprises and learn right at the beginning of their studies that there is such a thing, a social enterprise, mm -hmm. and they can finish their degree and actually not have to wait until or even maybe even start up their own social enterprise. That There is this thing that there is mm -hmm. this industry that they can join 
and it will give them so much more fulfillment. Oh, come on. Come on. You know? And so we're so excited yeah. about opening these young people's eyes to the concept of social enterprise, which many of them may have just, like they've heard of Thank You Water or they might have heard of, you know, a couple of like fa- more famous ones like yeah. Who Gives a Crap or something like that where they yeah. might have gone, oh, what's, what's the, I know that's not kind of a traditional business, but they sure. don't really understand what it is or that it's a social enterprise. So now we're going to have the opportunity to oh, teach so them about exciting. this. That is so exciting. And when does that start? That starts the teaching uh, Next is. year. So, yeah, first semester in, in uh, 2021. Oh, so good. Yep. Well, I, I know you're like, you're <sighs> right at the thick of trying to get, get everything together, yep. but it sounds like it's... Um, it's already got a lot of interest and yep. um, I've loved thoroughly um, doing the ACPNS course that uh, what postgraduate. Have you learned, Tim? Yeah, I tell you Come what. Come on. I you know, have ha- having um, been a, f- a founder of a charity myself and realizing I've learned all the things I'm doing wrong for, to start with, but also, which is good to actually know. I mean, we feel it fairly early days, only a few years old. And like anything, um, things don't always start out in perfectly well. It just starts by just getting in there and having a crack. And yeah. then as you mature, you grow from from infancy to adolescence, you realize the need for all the the... Board of Governance things in place, the, the fis- fiscal and ethical components to make sure everything is done well. So I'm learning a lot and hopefully it's so only... So you're not mad at me? I'm not <laughs> mad at you at all. I'm learning again how to be a student. I have to say too, um, I love being able to um, connect the academic world with this as well mm-hmm. um, because... Uh, researchers, you being one of them now as well, I'd, gosh, you've achieved so much. But um, researchers provide us with incredible insight and information to help us know, um, you know, how we can adjust yep. and and change the way we do things to yep. um, for the future. And so even even just kind of delving into that research, critical thinking, instead of just reading a, a, a popular book for my inspiration, yeah. you know, there's some powerful journal articles oh, yeah. out there, yeah. a realm of study that, that can, you know, really be um, so valuable. I haven't read a novel in years. Ah, uh, really? <laughs> Oh, goodness. Wow. Look, I, I like going back to university like someone who's been driving a car and is very confident driving mm. the car but has never actually had an instructor sit there and say, look, actually, this is a really good way, more efficient or effective way of doing driving. Let's yeah. say that, I use that analogy. And when and, and so you can be a very mm. confident, and, and I was certainly before I went to ACPNS myself. You know, I'm a yeah. graduate myself. and. You know, I'd been in the sector 20 years, yeah. working in the community, running organisations. You know, there were there were elements of my work that I felt very confident about. Sure. But when you go to university and go and do study at this level, which is the master's level, you know, you, you kind of ca- you get calibrated, you know, yeah. and you kind of go, oh, you know, I, I'd forgotten I wasn't doing that as well as. I should have, you know, it's like having a driving test. Totally. Uh, you know, I don't lesson think I'd pass my you... driving test now. <laughs> <laughs> I failed three times to get the first time. So. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. So that's when I tell people, like, come and do this course. And they say, but I'm working in the sector. I'm mm, already a leader in the sector. Yeah. And I say, yeah. Yeah, but you should still come and do this course. Even You're if you stu- can't yeah. do it, find someone within your yeah. organization, yes. put them through it, yes. the value that they will bring. That's um, right. To, and there's there's scholarships. I'm grateful to yes, be a scholar myself, someone that got a, one of the scholarships on offer. And there's ways to do it. Yeah. Um, and they get amazing lecturers like you that really care for you and support you and yeah. really will do bend yeah. over backwards yes. to get you through yes. to the other Yes. Side. And then to be able to – because we – the sector, the th- I'm talking there mm. about the non-profit sector and social enterprise, but mainly the non-profit sector. Yep. We need to elevate the professionalism of yes. the sector. And um, 
there are a lot of people like myself who train in a trade like nursing or mm -hmm. social work or whatever it might be. You get your undergrad yeah. and then you just kind of become part of the sector, but you don't really go back and learn around governance and mm -hmm. leadership and, you know, impact measurement and, you know, all of those really critical things that we need for the the community to understand how professional this sector is and that we're making a difference. We're not just talking and being do-gooders. Yeah. In that sense, you know, yeah, no, we are true. really professional about what we do and, you know, the impact that we make. You know, you make a great point. I think uh, it's one thing to just have an idea and, and have good intentions, but to sit down and build a plan and to be like, is this actually going to make a difference? Is it just all outcomes? I mean, outputs, outputs. right? Is it just all stuff we're yeah. doing? Yeah. Because the charity industry, I've seen it overseas. You would have seen it overseas. Yeah. Um, often can be can do a lot more harm by just doing yes. stuff than by actually sitting back, assessing how can we yeah. uh, do do um programs or or, yeah. or or meet a need yeah that it's actually going to have a positive impact if we're serious yeah. about making social change mm -hmm. we have to start measuring and reflecting and reviewing and taking it very seriously about yeah. the impact that we're making because we're there we're not doing good enough like we are really no. not doing good enough and even in australia we have millions and millions of dollars going into the sector through either the grants or donations, and we still have incredibly bad stats on homelessness and domestic violence mm. and poverty and child abuse and all of those terrible things that we want to address and we need to be looking for solutions for. And so, yeah, we need to be very accountable and start taking it seriously, and we want the community to know mm. that we're taking it seriously. And I like the way you kind of have, you emphasized, obviously there's a wide variety of issues, but how important employment and education um, actually is to getting to the root of these issues. If we can provide training yep. and education, which is empowerment, yep. employment, yep. Yeah, and throughout, whether it be through our businesses that we create or opportunities that we provide, it has a powerful, powerful um, ability to address those systemic problems, yep. right? When someone is empowered enough to take care of themselves, yep. to provide for themselves, yep. they feel dignity that they're, they're, they've graduated, they've yep. learned. I mean, there's so much... There's so much to that and so much what I love about the whole realm uh, that you're leading us into, which is so exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else that's kind of on the horizon, Ruth, that that you haven't shared? You're a very busy person. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything else that um, is well, on I'm the horizon Well, I'm working on a whole you? lot of things, really, again, around that research. Hmm. Um, and, one of, and, and my PhD was looking at culture. And that's my other, you know, really okay. big issue that I want to make a difference in. I, I want to look at the health and well-being internally of organisations mm. and how we are first and foremost looking after our staff yeah. and looking after ourselves mm -hmm. and how we're running organisations with the best possible culture. Mm. And so, yeah, that's my other really big interest in how do we do that because... When you think about non-profit organisations and social enterprises, they are usually working with or for traumatised people, people yeah. with domestic violence, you know, all of those, again, social issues, and it is quite uh, stressful and it is, uh, there's a lot of trauma mm -hmm. for... Vicarious trauma. Vicarious trauma. Compassion fatigue. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. So first and foremost, we need to make sure that we have healthy staff healthy volunteers, mm -hmm. people who are passionate, enthusiastic about what they're trying to do in their work. And if we don't have good culture, good organisational culture and good leaders who understand how to lead their culture and how to make sure that our staff and volunteers are, yeah, healthy mentally and physically, spiritually, whatever it is, you know, we've got to make sure that we 
look after the people that are in this sector and that are making a difference. So that's my other, yeah, really big interest and how do we do that? And I would like to see, here's, mm. here's my goal, I would like to see every organisation, not just non-profit, yep. every organisation I would like to see have a culture plan. So just as if you have a budget or mm -hmm. a marketing plan or any other plan, because you know it's important for your business, yep. I want to see every organisation have a culture plan where we understand how we're building and nurturing culture so that we get outcomes, mm -hmm. right? We've got to focus on outcomes, but how do we do that in a healthy, supportive, enthusiastic way so that people continue to love working on social issues and, and, and you know, the, the social outcomes that they're making? Phenomenal. How can people keep uh, in touch with you how can they follow you and learn more about this stuff that you're, yeah. you're doing well uh, so you said linkedin linkedin yeah, definitely ruth knight, um, dr um, ruth knight yeah dr ruth you? knight come and find me on linkedin because uh, i'm always sharing yep. what's going on uh twitter as yep. well you'll find me there um and also just give me an email or just look me up at ACPNS's website. So you yeah. just Google QUT ACPNS yeah. and uh, you'll find the website and all the amazing research that ACPNS does, our courses, how to get in contact with us, everything. And if you uh, look, and if you want to study with ACPNS, either uh, their postgraduate studies, but the new yes. undergraduate yes. course, you will have the privilege of you will. You learning will. from yours truly, <laughs> and I highly recommend it. I'm loving it myself. It is challenging, but anything good, yep. right? Anything yep. that right. Um, I think stretches you and pushes you beyond your yep. limits. I mean, yep. what a testimony. You know, here you are, Dr. Ruth Knight. Mm. Never even thought you'd even <laughs> no. step inside a university. Yep. I'm so honoured and privileged to know you and thanks for coming down. Thank thanks you. for coming into the studio. Thank you. Carving out this time and um, yeah, we've got to do it more often, eh? Yeah. Thank you.